Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to the April committee meeting on the Committee of Parks and Recreation for the New York City Council. I am Barry Grudenchik. I have the honor of chairing this committee for this council term. Today's hearing will examine the practices used by multiple levels of government to, to maintain our city's beaches and ensure that the water is safe for the millions of beachgoers who enjoy our beaches every year. City of New York has 14 miles of beaches managed by the Department of Parks and Recreation, which is a total of eight or nine beaches, depending on how you count. Uh, there are, in addition, 17 private beaches in the city. The city's Department of Health and Mental Hygiene is responsible for beach monitoring and surveillance of all the city's beaches. This consists of routine water quality monitoring and inspections of beach facilities in accordance with New York City and New York State health codes. Typically, a month before beach season, which begins Memorial Day weekend, water samples are collected from city beaches on a weekly basis for scientific analysis to ensure the water quality is safe for the beach to be open for swimming and recreation. The testing includes examining water samples for enterococcus, which are bacteria that, when found in beach water, tend to indicate possible contamination by fecal waste and signal the potential, potential presence of other pathogens. Under the New York State Sanitary Code and the city's health code, enterococcus concentrations for a single sample cannot exceed 104 colony forming units per 100 milliliters of water and cannot exceed 35 colony forming units per 100 milliliters of beach water for a series of five or more samples collected over a 30 day period. If those levels are reached, the beach may be entirely closed or have a warning against entering the water. High levels of rainfall can also affect beach water quality by resulting in combined sewer overflows when sewage and stormwater runoff bypass the treatment system and overflow into local bodies of water. When rainfall passes a certain threshold, which is different for every beach, a public warning is issued, and uh, that depends, of course, on which beach we're talking about. When testing results indicate that the water is not safe for swimming, a beach advisory or closure will be issued depending on the extent of the pollution. If a beach close, closure advisory is issued, the beach facility is required to post signage letting the public know of the advisory and whether or not the beach is indeed closed. Thankfully, over recent years, there have been very few complete beach closures, likely because of the city's increased commitment to clean water and environmental conservation, but warnings still do occur with some frequency. According to the Department of Health's 2018 Beach Surveillance Monitoring Program annual report, over 1,500 water samples from all 25 permitted beaches were analyzed with no beach-related recreational water illnesses or complaints occurring during the season. Additionally, 12 of the 17 private beaches were issued at least one swimming advisory notice, and there were 306 warning days as a result of private beaches exceeding uh, water quality standards, well, not exceeding, but not exceeding water quality standards. Of the public beaches that exceeded, uh, that had water quality issues, uh, there were 49 warning days and one closure day with a length of notification ranging from one week, one, one day to two weeks. As we approach our 2019 beach season, it is crucial that we maintain our commitment to clean and safe beaches. Our beaches attracted 16 million visitors last year, and that number is expected to climb as our city's population continues to increase and our climate continues to warm. I hope that this hearing can examine more closely the metrics that are used to determine how beaches are deemed safe, how the inspection process used by the Parks Department is integrated with the Department of Health Surveillance Program, and what the long-term future looks like for our beach safety and water quality. I want to thank you all for being here today, and again, remind you, if you would like to testify please sign up with the Sergeant at Arms. Um, our first panel uh, consists, uh, we see them there, um, Liam Cavanaugh, who is our first Deputy Commissioner of Parks and Recreation, uh, certainly no stranger to these hearings. And um, a stranger to these hearings, though, is uh, Trevor McProud, who is with the Department of Health and Mental Hygiene. Um, and can I ask you what your title is there? The Director of the Office of Public Health Engineering. Okay. That sounds fancy. Um, I'm going to ask my counsel to swear in uh, the first panel. Do you affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth in your testimony before this committee today? Yes. I do. Thank you. Are both of you testifying or? 
Okay, so whoever would like to go first. Good afternoon, Chair Grudenchik and members. I just want to say, well, I just want to announce that Mr. Andy Cohn has joined us. Uh, Council Member Cohn is from the Bronx. Thank you. No beaches in his district, though. Maybe a little one. Uh, good afternoon, Chair Grudenchik and members of the Parks uh, Committee. My name is Trevor McProud, and I'm the Director of the Office uh, of Public Health Engineering within the Division of Environmental Health. And on behalf of Commissioner Bar Barbeau, thank you for the opportunity to testify about the beaches, the department's beach surveillance and monitoring program. New York City's beaches function as an important recreational resource for city residents and neighboring communities. All beaches operated within New York City limits must be permitted with the health department. There are eight public beaches operated by the parks department and 17 privately operated members only beaches within the New York City limits. Beach season typically runs from Memorial Day weekend to Labor Day weekend, though for the last number of years, the season has been extended uh, one week post Labor Day. The health department is responsible for beach surveillance and monitoring for all permitted city beaches. The program is comprised of two major areas, the routine water quality monitoring at beaches for compliance and with water quality standards and the compliance inspections of beach facilities in accordance with New York City and New York State health codes. The results of routine water quality monitoring and inspections are compiled in the department's annual surveillance and monitoring beach reports, which we post online. Starting one month before the beach season, the health department monitors and samples each beach on a weekly basis with the exception of Rockaway and Breezy Point beaches, which are sampled biweekly. In addition to routine water quality monitoring, the health department monitors on a daily basis the regional wet weather conditions and occasional uh, wastewater treatment plant bypasses, operational upsets, and spills if they occur. This information can be used to assess and make beach status determinations on a daily basis. There are three swimming classifications for New York City beaches which are determined by assessing water quality, rainfall and pollution events, on-site sanitary surveys, and or historical information. Open for swimming, and waiting, warning not recommended for swimming and waiting, and closed, which is temporarily restricted for swimming and waiting. City, state, and federal regulations mandate the use of Enterococcus as the indicator organism for evaluating the microbi microbiological quality of marine recreational beach water. Enterococci are indicators of the presence of fecal material in the water and of possible presence of disease-causing bacteria, viruses, and protozoa. These pathogens can sicken swimmers and others who use the water for recreation. State water quality regulations provide two standards for the maximum allowable enterococci concentrations for bathing beaches. Any single for any single sample, it is 104 colony forming units. And for an average of a five sample set within a 30 day period, it is 35 CFU. When one or both of these water quality standards are exceeded, the health department takes actions to notify the public of the potential risks and conducts resampling to either confirm, remove, or escalate the notification as appropriate. Additionally, the health department has set rainfall thresholds to protect swimmers' health. Because most of the city has combined stormwater and sewer systems, high levels of precipitation may result in wastewater bypassing the treatment system and overflowing into local water bodies. These bypasses pose a public health threat to nearby beaches, and when these thresholds are met, a public notification is issued in the same way as is done for a sample result exceedances. The health department collects water samples from New York City beaches on a routine basis for scientific analysis. During sampling, an on-site sanitary survey inspection is performed to identify any existing or potential sources of pollution that are likely to affect beach water quality. Water samples are collected at knee depth in three feet of water from the center left and right of the beach. At larger beaches, such as Coney Island and Rockaway, samples are taken from multiple locations to ensure that adequate representation um, and reliable results. The collected samples are delivered to the health department's public health laboratory for analysis, and analysis for enterococci is completed usually within 24 hours. If the analysis if the analyses reveal that the sample results are above the criteria for the beach to be open for swimming and waiting, the health department will issue a beach advisory 
or potentially a closure, depending on the extent of the pollution. In addition to routine water quality sampling, the Health Department also conducts annual safety inspections and complaint inspections at bathing beaches to assure that all staff, especially lifeguards and supervisors, have proper certificates and coverage, including CPR certification. All required life-saving equipment is available, including rescue tubes, spine boards, first aid kits, and resuscitation equipment, and that there is proper signage posted on site. These inspections also evaluate beach facility hygiene and direct observations of conditions are supplemented by interviews with lifeguards and other personnel at the beach. It is essential that the public is aware whether conditions at New York City beaches are safe for recreational activity. When the status of any beach changes, the health department notifies the public through a number of ways. Beach operators are notified by phone, email, and or text as to the necessary on-site postings. And the health department, uh, the health department has developed easily to, easy to interpret signs for beach closures and warnings. And beach operators are required to post these signs in designated areas visible to beachgoers. A warning sign indicates that swimming and waiting are not recommended and a closed sign indicates that swimming and waiting are not permitted by order of the health department. The department administers uh, uh, Know Before You Go, which is a free texting service, um, which we have some material here for, that was introduced in 2014 that enables subscribers to learn the status of any of the eight public New York City beaches before they go to the beach. This is a tool that can also be used to deliver notifications of high priority water quality warnings or closures, as well as other safety messages such as warnings for high riptides um, and currents and closures for extreme weather and when beaches are open or closed for the season. Currently, there are 11,752 English language subscribers and 559 Spanish language subscribers. We also provide updates on our website, which includes a list of city beaches by borough and their respective status and all the recent sample results. Information is also available via Notify NYC, 311, and Health Department press releases when necessary. For 2018, between April and September, the department conducted routine water quality monitoring and sample collection at all 25 permitted beaches, and over 1,500 samples were collected and analyzed. Of those 1,500 samples, only 3.6% exceeded the maximum allowable enterococci limit, uh, which was 4.2% for the public beaches and 3.2% for private beaches. This decreased from 15.3% in 2017, um, or 4.9 for public beaches and 22.1 for the private beaches. Of the 2,675 total beach days in the summer, which is uh, collectively across all 25 beaches, there were 356 beach notification days uh, 355 of those were a warning um, posted, and there was one closure day in 2018. And this decreased from 848 warning days in 2017. In general, the water quality at New York City beaches is acceptable to fully support uh, the important benefits they provide in a healthy and safe manner. An analysis of our uh, data over the last 10 years shows that the number of beach notification days is uh, very highly correlated with the seasonal precipitation totals. It is difficult to say de definitively, but the relatively higher number of exceedances that we ex experienced in 2017 and the elevated notification days at certain beaches in 2018 were likely influenced by local weather patterns and therefore could potentially be vulnerable to the ongoing, ongoing climate change trends. The National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, or NOAA, has documented a 71% increase in the amount of precipitation that falls during heavy events in the Northeast United States, and that extreme rainfall events in May to October have increased uh, two to four times in the region. It may be reasonable to expect that beach notifications could increase if these normal and extreme climate trends are consistent at our local uh, level. Additionally, within the next few years, there will be revised water quality standards issued by New York State. These were passed by the uh, Environmental Protection Agency, or EPA, in 20, 2012, and currently being finalized at the state level. The standards will be more stringent than those currently used, and as a result, we are expecting more beach notification days. 
So in this case, um, more notification days will not mean that the water quality is getting worse as the water will be held to a stricter standard to allow recreational beach activities. With that, I thank you for the opportunity to testify today and I'm happy to answer any questions. We'll get to you in a little while. Commissioner. We've also been joined, I um, just want to say, by my colleague Andy King from the North Bronx, also no beaches. I'm landlocked, kind of. Uh, good afternoon, Chair Grudenchik and members of the Parks Committee. Uh, my name is Liam Cavanaugh. I'm the first Deputy Commissioner at New York City Parks, and I want to thank you for inviting us to discuss uh, the current quality of our beaches and, water, and the waters surrounding it. New York City Parks is the steward of 14 miles of beach. Last summer, we estimated 16.2 million people visited citywide. The beaches, which are, the beaches and boardwalk are open year round, of course, uh, but they are permitted by the health commissioner for swimming and bathing uh, from the Saturday before Memorial Day until the Sunday after Labor Day uh, when lifeguards are on duty and in accordance with Local Law 181 enacted in the fall of 2017. Eight public beaches are managed by the Parks Department, located in four boroughs, uh, Brighton and Coney Island, and Manhattan Beach in Brooklyn, Orchard Beach in the Bronx, Rockaway Beach in Queens, and Cedar Grove, Midland, South, and Wolf's Pond Beach in Staten Island. Parks is responsible for the daily cleaning of the beach year-round, but especially during the uh, swimming season. Uh, the agency removes debris from the sand, frequently empties trash receptacles, and cleans the comfort stations. Water testing is done by the Department of Health and passed through to parks uh, by public broadcast. Uh, our agency posts results on our bulletin boards at all beach comfort stations. Health will notify parks if the water quality reaches levels necessary to place the beach under advisory, where swimming and wading is not recommended, or closure, where such activities are prohibited. In those cases, parks will post specific signs indicating the beach status and health will inform parks when the beaches are ready to be reopened. Information regarding beach status is available through Notify NYC, Health's website, to which Park's web, beach web page is linked, or via text sending the message beach to 877-877 in order to get real-time opening, closing, and water quality information. Uh, to conclude, I appreciate the Council's interest and advocacy regarding this topic and look forward to our continued work with health and your colleagues uh, to make New York City's beaches cleaner and safer than ever. Health and parks enjoy a close working relationship and are always happy to participate in a dialogue about how to get even better. I'd like to thank you again for inviting me to speak today and testify, and I thank health for their remarks and will now be pleased to answer any questions you may have. Thank you, uh, Commissioner. Um, thank you. I gotta look up your title again. Thank you, Mr. McProud, for being here today. Um, it's amazing how many people uh, enjoy uh, our beaches. It's almost double the population of the entire city, which is saying something. And so uh, I'm glad to have this hearing. Um, I wanted to start, I guess, um, I could start with both of you. But um, Mr. McProud, in your testimony, You talked about water quality and the monitoring. Do you uh, test more? Last summer, it was interesting, you would have thought we had, if my memory serves me correctly, an extra 15 inches above what, of rain, ab above what might be considered normal at uh, Central Park and at some of the other reporting stations in New York City. And yet the number of incidents where the water quality was degraded was down. So I don't know if it's the heavy, heavy rains that are the problem or, you know, but it, it, it did rain last summer as well. And I'm just curious if your, your agency has found any correlation between, I assume there is a correlation between heavy rain and, and contaminated water. That's right. When we have looked back at the last 10 years, there, um, there's a correlation between the, the, those wettest years and uh, the number of uh, advisories that we have to post on those years. Uh, so there is a there is a correlation between weather patterns and, and water quality at the beaches, um, both because they may they are influenced by the uh, combined sewer overflow and the the way that the city's infrastructure is built, but also um, just in certain areas there there is runoff 
from, from non-combined sewer areas. And so we know that those, um, the amount of precipitation can impact water quality. Um, you said in your testimony that um, you collect water samples on a routine basis. And how often is routine? Every uh, beach, we sample uh, once a week at, at the minimum, except for Rockaways and Breezy Point, which we sample two, once every twice a week. So, uh, sorry, once every two weeks. Okay. Because they, um, over the, his, uh, the historical record, if we have sampled there, we know that they have um, uh, very high quality water. So we've made the determination that they didn't, don't need to be sampled on a weekly basis. Would you sample more often if, if there were heavy rain events? Does that cause you to do an, an extra sampling? And I know that it takes a while for the water to work its way into the water, um, into the larger bodies of water. But have you ever supplemented that because of a heavy storm or something? Like if we were to get a three inch rain in the summer, would you maybe do another sampling? We don't usually supplement sampling because of water quality, because we ha or sorry, uh, because of rain events, uh, and that's because we have uh, a very robust um, water quality monitor, uh, model that we have developed um, with DEP over the years and refined. So uh, we have, um, as posted on our website and in our reports, um, uh, a set of uh, rain thresholds that um, if those are um, exceeded, then we have, with, with a high amount of certainty, we know that the water quality will be impacted because of uh, combined sewer overflows mostly. And in those cases, be because of uh, um, the very uh, robust water quality hydrological modeling that's been done and with using both DEP harbor d um, sampling data and, and d uh, DOHMH, uh, beach sampling data um, to verify those models. We know that we don't necessarily need to go out and do sampling. We just uh, know with high amount of certainty that the water quality is impacted for a certain amount of time, and we issue that warning based on rainfall alone. The Rockaway Beach and Coney Island Brighton are the furthest into the ocean, mm -hmm. into the op open ocean, as opposed to, say, Orchard Beach or even the South Shore of Staten Island is mm -hmm. a little kind of tucked in there in Sandy Hook Bay. Is uh, is that the reason you believe that the water quality is better because of the open ocean and the yes it has uh, the, pr the primary reason is that they are uh, less impacted by the, the infrastructure and, and the, the runoff from the city and because of the hydrodynamic um, uh, currents that are there in the open ocean which really um, uh, act to you know re remove any potential contaminants uh, very quickly Let's, uh, I, know, uh, I don't want to hold you up, Mr. King, so I know you have a question, so I'm going to let you do that, and I'll go back to my line of questioning shortly. So, uh, Thank you, Mr. Chair. I appreciate certainly. that. And um, Commissioner and uh, Deputy Commissioner, excuse me, and, and of Health as well, Director of Health, my question is this. Um, after looking at reading your testimony and understanding, what's the term? Echo? Enterococcus. Enterococcus. All right. Sound like from Jurassic Park or something. Um, but that piece right there, you talk about the fecal matter that gets into the water from whatever marine life that's in the oceans. My question is, once you've identified that this, this bacteria is in the water, what relationship does humans have to correct it? Anything that's in the water and the marine life that's there, what interaction happens at that point? Or are we just waiting for nature to do its thing? Or is the rainwater a cleansing? Or what's those, what do those steps look like? For, for mankind. Uh -huh. So en enterococcus is, is, a, is a bacteria, it's, it's, uh, but it is not necessarily the bacteria that may make you sick that we're uh, uh, most concerned with in recreational water quality. Through, um, uh, through a large amount of research and, and um, documenting of potential epi epidemiological risks, the EPA um, since 1984 has indicated that that indicator bacteria, enterococcus, is um, highly correlated with the other um, potential um, bacteria and viruses and protozoa that may be in the water um, that may uh, mostly cause gastrointestinal illnesses if, if, if humans are exposed to it during recreation. Um, and so that, that bacteria is, is measured as a way to, uh, um, as a proxy for the potential um, other uh, 
harmful bacteria that could be in the water. Mostly, it is not because of uh, marine life or, or uh, what's happening in the oceans, but it's because of the human impact. It, it's an indicator of human waste that could be in the water based on sewage overflows or runoff from urban areas. And like you say, in we have through modeling and through working with our other um, agencies in the city, we know fairly well what happens with the currents and the tides and that uh, it, it usually in a certain amount of time, if there has been an impact, if we had sample results that indicated there was a problem, those uh, th that problem will be uh, you know, naturally attenuated by the, the, the natural motion and, and processes that are going on in the, the sound in the harbor and the ocean. Okay, so I take that as a no? As a no. It's a no. <laughs> okay, thank you, T. I appreciate it. Thank you for that. All right. Thank you, Council Member King. Um, let's say, unfortunately, we have a bad sample. Um, doesn't really matter where. And so, what happens, what does that set in motion? You, you get back a, a sample that uh, clearly indicates that a beach should be closed, a public beach in this case. What happens then? You go, can you work us through that process so the public will know exactly what you do, how you contact uh, this? I'm assuming this is a beach operated by uh, Parks and Recreation and, and how does that work? Yes. Um, Take your time. Yeah, okay. I expect it to be a long answer. <laughs> in, uh, in a, we, the health department samples almost all beaches on either on a Monday or a Tuesday, and those sample results take approximately 24 hours for the lab to process. And so the next day we will um, uh, find out the water quality results from the previous day's sample. If they are above the, the limit, say 104 for a, a single sample maximum, we will issue a, an advisory and uh, notify the beach manager that the, the and in this case it would be the um, commissioner's office and, and the local the beach manager for that borough. And they will have to post those, the signs and uh, the health department would make its notifications through its website, through its uh, uh, other, through its um, mobile notification service mm -hmm. and other things like that. Once we have that first sample and the, the beach is under advisory, the health department also uh, takes a resample to either confirm the, the condition is there or to see whether or not that condition has uh, naturally attenuated. So the, that sample result will be taken the day that we have that the exceedance or the high sample, and we'll be ready the next day. So in most cases, the sample result will be uh, demonstrate that water quality is returned to normal and that the beach can be open, and that process can uh, be um, completed by Thursday or Friday so that the beaches that see the most um, uh, use during the weekends can uh, re return to an open status with uh, no health concern from the health department's perspective. Commissioner Cavanaugh, so you get a notice from them. Um, can you explain what the Parks Department will do at that point? <clears throat> yes, as, as my colleague said, they, they notify my office directly as well as the individual beach managers. If there is an advisory or a closure, we confirm with the local management that they have, have the notice, uh, that they have the sign to put up, that they have contacted people who need to know about it, such as the police, uh, and other partners we work with at the specific beach. Uh, we post the information on our website and make it available. We have a, a similar um, uh, know before you go sort of uh, uh, feature that, that available to people who use our facilities and they can also check in and see whether or not there is a closure in effect for any particular beach. When a closure takes place, uh, are the lifeguards still on the beach even though the beach is technically closed? They are on. They are. They are not at their normal posts. Uh, they're not sitting in chairs. They, um, you know, monitor the beach. They help us, you know, explain to the public uh, about the situation. Uh, but they are technically not on posts surveilling the water for swimming activities. And when a beach is closed, um, I assume you try very. Hard, I know you try very hard to keep people out of the water. But I guess some people 
you'll, you've had occasion where people have gone in anyway. It can be difficult okay. to keep people out of the water on a hot day. Okay. Um, all right. Uh, I'm going to defer right now to uh, Councilman Cohn, who actually was brought up on the beach. <laughs> uh, thank you, Chair. Uh, I would I've spent hours and hours more than I think anybody uh, on the council studying the conditions at Rockaway Beach. I'm always it may look like I'm taking a nap, but I'm really studying the conditions at the beach. Uh, thank you. I appreciated the testimony. Uh, I, I, it does sound to me, though, essentially that it, it's really uh, the modeling that you sort of you know what the conditions what to expect. Because the testing, it sounds like, takes a day to actually get the testing. But that doesn't do you really a lot of good. That condition could blow over in a day. So y you will issue a warning uh, when you actually think the condition exists. Yes. Uh, based on rainfall, we will issue preemptive warnings mm -hmm. um, uh, without making any uh, additional determinations because the, the modeling is, is uh, consistent enough that we know that that uh, and it's, you know, there, we have a table of varying lengths depending on how much rain that within the previous 24 hours uh, to, de to determine the, the duration of that um, uh, warning that needs to be posted. Uh, and uh, I don't know anybody from the Department of Health is here today, but the, they're, they're responsive in terms of getting you the information promptly and... I, so I'm, I'm from the Department of Health. Oh, your Department yes. of Health. And, uh, and, and oh, we I, that's why it says health on here. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Got it. And so, yeah, we collect over uh, 1,500 samples because uh, despite the fact that the, the modeling in, uh, around rain uh, precipitation is, is very accurate, we still go to every beach save Rockaway and Breezy Point once a week to confirm it with uh, um, samples and to, to make, to be assured that, it, that every beach is always safe for public recreation. So, uh, so then just so I'm clear, who is the arbiter of whether or not there should be a warning issued or the beach should be closed? For water quality purposes, yes. it's the health department. It's health. So, I mean, in theory, the, the modeling is, I don't know if the modeling is available to the par department, but in theory, but the same reason if you know if there's you know two inches of rain, you should know at certain locations we're going to have a problem. We are familiar with the patterns, uh, but we rely on the expertise of the health department to inform our decisions. Yes, but and, and obviously we, we feel like that's working well that everybody's on the same page. And again, yes. I guess I'm just really concerned about not that I don't have any confidence in interagency you know the agencies working together, but you don't you. The information is important that it gets to the public as expeditiously as, as possible. Absolutely. So, um, you know, if 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 the if there needs to be a, a warning or notification based on water quality results, uh, we, in most cases, talk with the parks department the day prior to say next morning before anybody's on the beach, you have to post the warnings. That's great. Can I ask what is the there's y you referred to permitted beaches. And public beaches are public beaches and permitted beaches the same thing, or public beaches for are, are permitted for swimming and and bathing, a technical term, by the health department from the Saturday before Memorial Day to the Sunday after Labor Day. But there are non-public beaches in the city of New York. Those are permitted also. Yes, that's right. So there are 17 um, what we call private beaches that. Um, are permitted to because they are public in the sense that they offer a service to a membership or more than you know a, a private residence. We um, we th we then have the jurisdiction over that public activity. Similar to uh, our, my office, also permits bathing establishments. So there's p p uh, deep, uh, parks department pools, public pools, but there's also very large pools that are, um, that have a large amount of the public attend them, but may have a members only or uh, some sort of membership that we also regulate and permit. Uh, on that point, I'm just, I, I don't know why, I don't, I'm surprised I don't know this as I'm sitting here. The coastline of the city of New York is all public. Can I walk anywhere, if I can get there? Yes. Uh, there are some places that are in private hands that I, where, you know, below the high tide line, okay. you're allowed to walk, but but they are privately. Below the high tide? Below the high tide line, yes. You can walk up to the high tide line. 
anywhere. Okay. The, uh, the, you know, the last thing I'll just say is uh, I, I, I'm not sure if I was aware, or maybe it's been mentioned before, no, before you go, but we should do a better job of promoting that. Uh, it, it doesn't sound like, you know, that there are as many subscribers as there could be, and I think that could be very useful information. We should try to do a good job of getting the word out. Uh, thank you, Chair. Thank you, Councilman Cohen. I, just to follow up, I assume that if there is a major closure and I and any of these beaches, the eight, um, would be a major closure because, you know, at Rockaway certainly you could have well over, I'm, I'm sure well over 100,000 people coming off the subway and um, so that would go to the mass media also. So you would, you would go to the newspapers and, you know, internet and wherever you could um, to display this information. Yes, and we, we do have a, uh, a, a longstanding relationship with the MTA uh, to both post notices uh, on subway stops leading to Rockaway and to Coney Island, and to use their informational kiosks to post information about disruptions to beach services during the operating season. And Councilman Cohen has I'm sorry. One maybe, more. Just one more. Maybe like two more. I don't just know. like Colombo. Uh, we use the modeling as the, as the primary uh, to make decisions about closing. Uh, how do we decide when it's safe to reopen? So um, the modeling... All, we have a table um, in our report and, and on, online which uh, for each uh, intensity of rainfall also has a duration, so say 24 hours or 36 hours if, if there's been extremely high amounts of rainfall, say over 2.5 inches at this beach, then it results in a 36-hour advisory. Um, and that is based on water quality modeling, um, and uh, which is verified with historical um, water quality data that we um, you know, partnered with DEP th throughout the years to re refine and, and use. They use that same model to uh, um, base their water body advisory system on, which is not the, the beaches, but uh, other water bodies throughout the, the city that may uh, have reduced water quality after large amounts of rain. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Councilman Cohn. We have been joined by Councilman Jimmy Van Bramer, who uh, we haven't had a member here with a beach yet, but uh, you kind of almost do. Close. Close. Depends on how you define a beach, but uh, back there in Western Queens. Um, we'll just get to... Uh, the water quality in New York Harbor has been getting steadily better over the past decades. I assume that's also been the case for historic data in terms of beach closures. Yeah, as I said that there's a there's a trend for water quality at beaches, there's a trend with um, precipitation. So it's uh, not necessarily a as a uh, clearly demonstrable, you know, improvement that the EP has for their harbor stations that they sample. But um, at the beaches, you know, as I said, the, the water quality is generally good. And the, the number of advisory days or, or um, closure days that we have on a whole compared to the 2,600 days that we have for all beaches is, uh, is fairly good. And that has remained so over the last 10 years. All right. Um, Back, I think it was 2014, I'm going to take back a little history, and I, I certainly I think uh, Commissioner Kavanaugh knows about this. Uh, I was working for Borough President Melinda Katz, and um, there was a Saturday, a very hot Saturday in the month of June, when the entire Rockaway Beach was closed. And my understanding, my memory of the incident, and Commissioner Kavanaugh certainly, um, if you have a different memory, uh, apparently a truck was driven on the beach having to do with a dredging operation, sand replenishment, and um, my memory is that the DOH ordered the beach closed. And obviously um, uh, that was a very difficult day for, uh, for the beachgoers because they really weren't allowed in the water. Um, it was a difficult day for the Parks Department because they had the onerous task of keeping uh, literally tens of thousands of people out of the water. I know there were PEP workers there, there were rangers, there were police officers there. Um, as the chair of the Parks Committee and um, uh, somebody who obviously has an abiding interest in making sure 
as many people can visit our New York City parks. I'm just wondering what happened after that incident, whether there were, were protocols established, um, because I know we are doing some, um, some replenishment now at Rockaway, and I would hate to think that this incident could reoccur. I, 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 so I just want to know if there is, is there a hotline between health and like we have between the Kremlin and the White House? Is there a, a hotline for uh, parks and, and health department? Uh, it's not quite a hotline, okay. but we do have regular a communication. Beach line. Okay. We do have regular communication. And I, the, the situation you described, it, it was a, a, a terrible incident and had uh, enormous impacts. Uh, however, we were in communication with the health department that day, uh, and you know the decision, decision to close uh, didn't affect the entire Rockaway Beach. Uh, there was a good portion of the beach already closed because of the pumping operations, and it was not scheduled to open that day. And the section uh, was one of the most popular sections of the beach, was closed because of the impact of the pumping operation. Uh, we, I, I hate to admit it, but we could not get uh, uh, cooperation from the contractor to limit their vehicle operation on the beach. It was not one vehicle, okay. it was okay. multiple vehicles and some very large vehicles. Okay. Uh, and it did create an unsafe situation, but it, it was not communicated uh, as, as timely and effectively as it, as it could have been, and we have taken steps to, uh, to correct I that. I, yeah, I, I have not heard of anything like that since I, no. you know, was not my favorite call of the mm -hmm. year to have to tell the borough president the uh, the beaches were closed that day. But I thank you for your follow up, and I appreciate it very much. Um, last month, um, a vessel suffered a 15-inch hole in one of its fuel tanks in New York Harbor, and uh, approximately uh, 100,000 gallons of fuel oil uh, were released um, along the east coast of, of New York. Um, can you update us on? cleaning operations and how it might affect um, the upcoming beach season. Yes, so um, in, in this case and in the event that there is any oil spill in New York waterways, there is a, a joint task force between the U.S. Coast Guard and, and New York DEC who are the primary agencies to uh, uh, lead the response and, and certify the, the cleanup. Um, that said, um, NYSIM was involved and we were notified of it. Uh, we've been um, uh, you know, communicating as necessary with them and the fact that the beaches are closed right now in, for swimming um, doesn't necessitate as much of a you know, public outreach as, as it would if it were swimming season. Um, and from, what I, from the information that I have that we have for the health department, the Coast Guard and DEC have said that all cleaning operations will be completed before bathing season. Um, and I would just direct um, you to the Coast Guard as the primary point of information for whether or not that, um, that has been completed as of now or when it will happen. So for, um, for environmental disasters such as this, it really is, it's not your bailiwick, so to speak. It would really fall upon the Coast Guard and the DEC. If it is a, a spill um, within the water bodies, th yes, that's that's correct. Okay. That said, if you know, in the event that it was bathing season and, and this would, uh, you know, really impact recreation, we we would be on the beaches. We would perform sampling if needed uh, to determine whether or not uh, if beaches were closed, if they could be open and things like that. Okay, and we don't have any beaches were closed. We don't have any reports of anybody being stricken because of. Okay. Um, you mentioned in your testimony um, that uh, DEC is in process of revising their water testing criteria and you expect it to get uh, the standards to be made more stringent. Can you go into that a little more? Is there anything else that you could tell us about that? Yes. Um, the, the recreational water quality standards are set at a national level by the EPA. So the enterococcus standards that, we've, that we have now that are promulgated at the state and the city level were set in 1984 and had remained the same until 2012, the EPA issued new uh, water quality standards. And so since 2012, we've been anticipating that they would be, uh, those new standards would be promulgated at the state level, um, which has happened. The New York State DEC uh, proposed new standards, which the comment, comment period ended yesterday, I believe. So once those uh, become effective, then we anticipate that the New York State Health Department will uh, 
issue those same or similar standards for specifically at bathing beaches, which we would then implement. The, the standard is still in Terrocaucus. It's, it is, there, there are different numbers and different ways of calculating the number. So I mentioned that one of the, the criteria was an average based over a 30-day period. There's still that average um, at, at the same level, but there's now a new uh, calculation method called the statistical threshold value, or STV, and that instead of uh, averaging all of the all of the samples within that 30-day period to, to uh, achieve a value to determine whether it's below 35, it says that no more than 10% can be above a certain level, which is because of that, it, it's a small different, it's a different way of calculating it, but it, we think it will be have a big impact when we've done retroactive, retrospective analyses of our, of our water quality data. Do you anticipate the beaches being closed more frequently? I we anticipate more advisory days, okay. not necessarily closures. In, in general, um, at, you know, specifically at the parks department beaches, there, are, there have been very few actual closures because of water quality um, right. samples. It's mostly an advisory where we warn people, but the impact isn't that uh, nobody can go swimming. We just uh, post that health advisory information. And do you, does your agency, I mean, fortunately we've been very uh, lucky that we haven't had uh, too many incidents of illness. Do you track that like you would any other disease or? Yes, we, um, we track that through our um, Bureau of Communicable Disease uh, who um, are looking at any, a, a, a number of different waterborne um, illnesses which can be either from um, ingesting water through drinking water but also through um, recre um, water recreation. So those uh, diseases are reportable and are, are tracked through our um, uh, epidemiological uh, arm of the health department which is a very robust process. So. We work with them to see whether or not there's any signals that could be potentially associated with um, recreating at either our beaches or our, the pools that we oversee as well. There's also a, um, there's 311 uh, complaints that we can respond to. We field uh, 311 complaints related to beaches, which can include um, reported illnesses and, and we haven't received those either. All right. Um. Just get off the contamination. Um, I, I know that you testified that um, really it's Mother Nature that cleans us. I, mean, I guess in the case of an oil spill, um, we would try to clean the beaches. And, um, debris, floating debris and all that, is that the responsibility of the Coast Guard? If you had a log or is that kind of stuff, which could be extremely dangerous to somebody swimming, how does that? Uh, if well, I can say that as the city as a whole has many programs to reduce uh, the potential accumulation or, or impact of debris from the city. If, if there are large large pieces of debris, if it's, you know, that could be a hazard for shipping or things like that, then it would be a Coast Guard issue. But I would just say that DEP does have some, uh, as part of their harbor mon monitoring program, they do uh, do some float holes monitoring and city in terms of uh, the land side operations there are, are many activities that the city does to to reduce the impact of debris and, and litter that could uh, find its way to the water bodies okay uh, we've been joined by councilman Eric Ulrich who actually represents the Rockaways parts of the Rockaways and I think he has some questions at this oh, time thank yes mr. chair thank you very much I apologize uh, for being late I didn't get a chance uh, to read your testimony uh, Commissioner, so I apologize. Um, two quick questions, obviously, about Rockaway. Um, the, uh, the sand replenishment, is that on track? I know that's not the, the main topic of today's hearing, but maybe you could just give a quick update. Is that all right? Yes, it began Sunday at 5.30. There was a disruption due to the uh, overnight storm, but it is pumping again. So we ho we're hoping we're still on target that it'll be ready by the beach opening. By the start of the hurricane season. Yeah, great. All right. <laughs> uh, just in time. <laughs> The, uh, the second question I have is pertaining to uh, uh, an issue that uh, Costa Constantinides and I have sort of taken up, which is uh, abandoned boats in Jamaica Bay and along the waterfront in New York City. We're trying to put together a task force to identify or create an agency that could be responsible for helping us to remove derelict 
boats and large debris from the waterways throughout the city. And in the past, council members individually, uh, such as myself, uh, have used our discretionary money. And we've given it to the Department of Sanitation. They then go out and hire a private contractor to go out and remove large bulk items, abandoned boats, uh, boats and other debris from the waterways. Uh, DEP recently did a, um, a pilot program. I think they removed over 100 boats uh, from uh, Jamaica Bay and I think from the Bronx, actually. There was some uh, boats in uh, one of the uh, estuaries there. But anyway, the point is, is Parks Department involved in any of those uh, discussions? Because some of those boats are along the beaches and uh, along the areas that Parks Department maintains. So are you in, how do you handle those types of situations and how do you get involved? Uh, yes, we do get involved. Uh, we have contracts that we manage directly uh, to remove abandoned boats from our property. Uh, we have used them to remove abandoned boats from other properties as well, not directly under our jurisdiction. Uh, but it was a, um, I guess, a, it came about uh, you know, after Hurricane Sandy when there was many boats and lots of debris left on our beaches that we could not remove with our own staff and equipment, and we needed some expertise to do that. So yes, we are actively involved in that work. And, uh, and lastly, you know, I also represent um, uh, How the Howard Beach community, which is served by Frank Charles Park, and I know we've uh, sort of visited this on several occasions. It's technically a federal park. It's under the National Park Service. Uh, but I know that the, uh, under the Bloomberg administration, there was an agreement between the city parks and also national parks for, I guess, sharing responsibility or um, I don't know what the what is the right part you know a partnership maybe what's the cooperative management uh, co -op, agreement. thank you the cooperative management agreement uh, some of these federal parks are in desperate need of uh, capital work and uh, we've yet to identify a way or a path to use city tax dollars to make light renovations to tennis courts basketball courts baseball fields in areas that are not served by a city park this is the only park that is in that community that I represent and uh, we tried in previous fiscal years to, to broach that issue. We're now coming up to another budget season. Uh, we may engage the um, uh, Alex Zablocki's group, the uh, Conservancy, uh, yes. to be a sort of as a fiscal conduit, if you will, to try to do that. Um, I'm hoping that, that city parks will be helpful in, in making that money actually go to its intended purpose and, and authorizing us to use it there because it, it is the only park in my uh, neck of the woods over there. We don't have a city park and we're, and we're looking for you know, cooperation from uh, city parks on that front. Uh, we, we absolutely will cooperate to the extent that we can. I'm not familiar with all of the restrictions on city cop all dollars and where they can be spent, but we have tried to work with the National Park Service to uh, ma better maintain uh, Frank Charles Park, uh, in some years we've been able to do that, and others the agreements were not uh, put in place in time for us to step in and help. But I, we're, we're still interested in that, in that cooperative spirit. If, if I can, uh, I think in a couple of weeks we may arrange a phone call with Josh Liard, who I know you know very well, yes. and, um, and uh, Jen uh, Nassir, uh, Nassassian. Nassassian, I'm sorry, Nassassian. And um, I know that we'll have the Queens Parks Commissioner on board, but maybe someone in your office that handles the budget uh, can also uh, participate in that phone call just to sort of talk through some of these issues to see if there's a way for us to get it done in the upcoming fiscal year. It's a really important issue for my constituents. Yes. And there is a beachfront there as well that we have volunteers maintain and, and uh, help clean up and do things at, but there's a lot of work that needs to be done there and we're hoping that uh, parks can, uh, can be helpful as well. So. We'll be happy to participate in those calls. Thank you, uh, Commissioner. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Thank you, Councilman Ulrich. Um, last question uh, for this panel. We have federal beaches, as um, Councilman Ulrich just mentioned, uh, Great Kills comes to mind on the South Shore. Do you monitor that water, or is that done by the feds? That, uh, we do not monitor that water. Okay, so, um, all right, that's, that's, that's pretty easy. Um, I wanna thank you for your testimony today and for being here, and uh, it was great to, to uh, meet you, Mr. McCrowd, and of course, uh, First Deputy Commissioner, always a pleasure to see you. So thank you for being here today. Uh, with that, I'm going to call the only other panel, um, uh, Mike DeLong, I hope I got that right, uh, from Riverkeeper. Mike, are you here? Okay. And Kate Fritz from the National Resources Defense Council. So take the stage.
Again, if anybody wants to testify, last call. Next month is budget. Probably be more people there. <laughs> All right, um, we do not swear you in. However, um, whoever would like to go first. Uh, Can I go first? Sure. Okay. Good afternoon, um, Chairman and members of the committee. Thank you for convening this important hearing. My name is Kate Fritz. I'm here on behalf of Natural Resources Defense Council, NRDC. As you may know, NRDC is national nonprofit legal and scientific organization that is very interested in uh, the quality of life issues around New York City and environmental issues. Um, and this statement was prepared with the help of NRDC attorneys Eric Goldstein and Larry Levine. Um, NRDC has reviewed the last several years of Department of Health and Mental Hygiene's Beach Surveillance and Monitoring Program reports. These reports are informative and the work of the department has been helpful in alerting the public as to water quality conditions at city beaches. Nevertheless, and despite the progress that has been made over the years in reducing pollution, pollution discharges into New York City's waterways, climate change is posing new challenges to beach water quality. Increased precipitation from climate change is likely to trigger more frequent combined sewer overflows, which will pose significant long-term threats to beach water quality. It is essential that the city develop its sewer infrastructure in anticipation of more rainfall in the future. Combined sewer overflows cause significant problems after even modest rainstorms. This condition occurs almost every time it rains in New York City. Raw sewage, pet waste, trash, and polluted runoff mix with huge volumes of rainwater and are funneled into local waterways where people swim, fish, and boat. People who come into contact with such contaminated water can suffer health impacts, including intestinal illnesses, rashes, and infections. The city seeks to manage these risks through monitoring and beach closure. However, trends in, in precipitation indicate that sewage pollution from stormwater runoff will only get worse in the coming decades. From 2016, a relatively dry year, to 2018, the number of days with the combined sewer, sewer overflow rose by 44% from 85 days to 122 days. In other words, New York City experienced sewage overflows on average once every three days in 2018. Though not all sewage overflows result in a beach quality issue that triggers a public health notification, the beach quality trends roughly map onto the CSO trends. The um, department's 2018 report noted that bacterial exceedances at city beaches are consistent with recent increases in the summer heat index as well as increases in per total precipitation in the Northeast United States. Of the 356 notification days given at city beaches in 2018, uh, approximately 60% were issued as a result of rainfall events. The percentage for 2017 was 11% and for 2016 was 40%. This data shows that increased precipitation threatens water quality at the city's beaches and that climate change will make this problem much worse. The Mayor's Office and the Department of Environmental Protection, DEP, are currently developing a New York City long-term sewage control plan. This plan is likely to shape billions of dollars in sewer infrastructure investments. If it's done well, the plan could help safeguard beach, quali beach water quality in the face of climate change by reducing or eliminating sewage overflows. However, the Mayor's Office does not currently intend to make this plan available for public review before submitting it to the state. One important step that you, Chairman Grudenchik, and your co council colleagues could take is to urge the mayor's office and DEP to release the long-term sewage control plan in its draft form per, for public review. Such a step would give the city council and all New Yorkers an opportunity to see what the administration is planning and to allow experts a chance to help strengthen the plan. Thank you for your attention, and NRDC stands ready to work with you to help New York prepare for the urgent challenges climate change will cause for water quality at New York City's beaches. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. Mr. Dulong. Uh, thank you, Chairman Grevenchik and members of the Council Committee on Parks and Recreation. Uh, I'm Mike Dulong. I'm a senior attorney with Riverkeeper. Um, Riverkeeper is a nonprofit. We protect the Hudson River and New York City drinking water. And as part of our mission, we test the waters in and around New York City. We monitor shorelines for pollution 
and we've been fighting for decades to clean up sewage discharges that cause beach closures and often make waterways throughout the five boroughs unsafe to fish, swim, and even touch. Um, so I'm here for three reasons. One is to point out that these closures occur because of sewage discharges. They are directly related to them. Every single waterway in New York City is affected by them, um, whether there is a public beach, private beach, or not. And there is recreation going on in every single waterway in New York City. Uh, and DEP's plans will not solve the problem. Um, so in the report, the 2018 Department of Health report um, states that public beaches were on warning 49 days and one and there was one closure day. That's more than double what happened in 2017. Uh, there were 22 warnings then. It's more than four times in 2016 when there were only 12 warnings, and there were 16 warnings in 2015. And note that this that's different. What uh, Department of Health was uh, comparing were the private and public beach warning days. I'm talking about only the public beach warning days. Um, so what was the difference? 2018 saw a significant amount of rainfall, 32 inches. This is from May to October. It saw 32 inches compared to 24 inches. Um, and so with rainfall in New York City comes sewage. Uh, in, and I'm going to repeat exactly what Kate said, but in, That's okay. in 2016, um, the number of days with sewage discharges was 85, and in 2018, it was 122, and that's growing. It grew by 44%, and the water quality sampling results are, sh are reflecting this. Uh, what the Water Trails Association did, they sampled waters uh, right off the coast all around New York City. Their 2018 results were miserable. They were, it was gross. It was a gross year. Uh, and indeed, the Department of Health uh, found the same. Um, their conclusions are con congruent with ours, that this was probably caused by increased rainfall and increased heat. And these two problems are only expected to grow worse. Uh, New York City's panel on climate change expects a 1.1 to 8% increase in precipitation by the 2020s. That's a year away. Uh, a 4 to 11% increase by the 2050s. Um, and in heat, we expect an increase between 4 and 5.7 degrees by the 2050s. And so what we are going to see in the future is more beach warnings, more beach closures. Uh, and unfortunately, the beach surveillance monitoring report is slightly misleading in that it, it states that only a fraction of the warning days are due to wet weather. That's not true. They are all due to wet weather. All of the pathogens all the pollutants that get into the water that cause beach closures occur during wet weather days, whether that is stormwater sleeping, sleeping pollutants off the street or stormwater mixing with the CSO to overwhelm the system and dump raw sewage into our waters. Um, now, Riverkeeper believes, and it is our mission to make every single waterway in New York accessible for use, for human contact, and for recreation. And last year, the New York Times had promoted the idea that we could have a beach off of Manhattan. That idea is possible. We should have beaches everywhere. We should have water contact everywhere. Uh, creeks like uh, Newtown Creek, Gowanus Canal, um, the Bronx River, all these waterways are calm. They are places that there are fewer boats. There's a less wave action. These are places where it's safe to get into the water and it would be safe if we could clean up the sewage going into the water. All of those waterways could be beaches. Um, and last, I want to point out that if we have a couple recommended recommended actions, I won't go through all of them, but tonight there is a hearing on um, the Department of Environmental Protection's long-term control plan for citywide and open waters. Um, these are the discharges, the city's plan to control discharges going into the major waterways, Hudson River, East River, Harlem River, the western portion of Long Island Sound where there are a lot of, um, a lot of beaches. Uh, what happens in that plan is going to determine how safe the waters are going forward. So we urge you to get engaged in that plan. We urge you to ask DEP to release that plan to the public and to the council's oversight um, before it goes to D DEC, before it goes to the state. And I hope to see you there tonight. Thank you for- Don't look too closely, but I, it's not the <laughs> previous poll, so. Uh, but. I think I have some questions for you, but I think uh, Councilman Cohen had one. Uh, thank you. Uh, just so you know, I have been, uh, and the chair knows, I, I've been a big advocate of a uh, 
a project in my district called Daylight in Tibbetts Brook, which uh, if it came to fruition would divert a significant amount of water out of our sewer system and, uh, and into the uh, Harlem River. But I, I'm curious about the data because I, I haven't seen it. For some reason, I was under the impression that, we, that the city was making progress. Uh, in terms of the, is, is there a difference between uh, uh, sort of qualitative versus quantitative discharges? Are we doing, is the quality of the water coming out consistently bad on a, when, we're, when, uh, on when we have a CSO? Is it the same? Have we made any improvement on the quality of the water? Like, like the water used to be really terrible when, when we had a CSO, now it's just bad. Like, is there any improvement on that front? There is no doubt that there has been a huge, huge improvement from even from the 70s, if you want to look back to the 90s. And looking forward, the city is still making improvements. Um, they are, it's not the quality of the water, I think it's the quantity of the amount of CSO that is coming out that is untreated. Uh, so some of the things that the city has planned are uh, captured sewage capture tunnels in certain waterways that will capture some portion of the existing CSO that is coming out. So yes, it is getting better, but not a single one of the plans that the city has for any of the waterways will make the waters compliant with the Clean Water Act. Since uh, the late 80s when um, uh, the one for Flushing Bay under uh, along College Point Boulevard, um, where there are two soccer fields on top of it. We're going to be baseball fields. That's how long it took to uh, the amount of people playing soccer greatly increase, so we changed it from baseball fields to soccer fields. Do you have an opinion? Just uh, curious. Um, there were some people that wanted to build a big basin underneath, and others wanted to store in line in the sewers. I always thought in line storage, as a homeowner, I don't want that stuff. Uh, I'm at the top of the terminal moraine, but you can still get a sewer back up anywhere pretty much. So any opinion on that? I think what the city is doing now is they are considering inline storage and they are considering uh, capture on the back end. Uh, our solution would be both. You should be maximizing the capacity of the system so that you can capture as much sewage in it, yes, without backing up into homes and without being dangerous. So those calculations are tricky and the city is doing them, but it, it could never be enough to capture all the sewage in the system. It's just there is not the capacity there. So the, the back end capture is really the only solution. I know that it 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 um, it can be very difficult, and they you know without telling us that it was supposed to be a 40 million gallon tank, and it became a 28 million gallon tank. So it was almost an inch of rain, which at that time would occur over the watershed like five times a year. But it went down to like 0.7 uh, tenths of an inch, which greatly increased the amount of overflow, as I reckon remember. I, I want to thank you for being here today and uh, for your work. It's extremely important. Um, your advocacy, uh, clean water, should be a goal that um, all of us share. We've been joined uh, by my colleague uh, who represents Waterfront but doesn't have a beach either, but uh, uh, that is Francisco Moya, um, represents a part of the area that I was talking about, Flushing Bay, um, and the uh, issues that we have there. So. Uh, seeing that there are no more members, I want to thank you. Uh, thank you. This panel is dismissed. Uh, seeing that there are no more uh, members of the public uh, ready to testify, I want to thank you all for being here today, uh, for your interest in uh, the safety of the water in New York City and its surrounding um, uh, ocean waters and, uh, of course, the quality of our beaches. And with that, uh, I will close this hearing at 2.20. Thank you all for being here today.